Can I just begin by saying thank you for being here this morning. I believe that God will honor this in your life and in the life of your family. Thank you for being here. What a great day to come. What a beautiful day to come and celebrate and to worship the God of creation. Last week's sermon on the Areopagus or Mars Hill up on that rock from the end of Luke, uh, from Acts chapter 17, it was rich <coughs> in truth for today. Boy, I just have just grown to deeply love Paul's sermon up on Mars Hill. You may know it's Art Mars Hill or the Areopagus there in Athens, Greece. The point that I got stuck on in my life from this past week is this. It goes along with what we've shared this morning. God is not a taker. He is a giver. He is a giver. There's three events in the life of our church today that drove this home for me. Let me first remind you of that point from Acts chapter 17, verses 24 and 25. The God who made the world and everything in it, He is Lord of heaven and earth. And He does not live in shrines made by human hands, neither is He served by human hands as though He needed anything. Because He Himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. Our takeaway from last week from that in verse, from verse 25 is that God is not a taker. He is a giver. And for me, I thought, how, do, how does that look? What does that look like in my life? And, and, I, and I won't take time to, to, to do the whole thing, but may I just give you the biblical principle of giving? A very biblical principle of giving. God's oatmeal box is bigger than my cup. You know what God does? God is not a taker. He is a... I'm not a waitress. <laughs> God is not a taker. He is a giver. And He gives 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 until my cup is full. And then do you know what He does? He just keeps giving it, doesn't He? And we say in our lives that we are drinking from the saucer because my cup has overflowed. Can I just give you one little caveat to that picture? That cup right there represents my needs, not necessarily all of my wants. Remember Paul said, My God shall supply all of your needs according to the riches of His oatmeal box in Christ Jesus. Can I get a witness? Have you witnessed that in your life? Have you witnessed that in your life this week? God is not a taker. God is a giver. Amen. I wasn't a waitress. Did I ever say that? Can I just say to you that in the Old Testament, the principle of tithing apparently was this. This is 90%. And God just dumps 90% out and then some spills out on the plate. And that other percent that He spills out on the plate is the opportunity that we have to share back or to give back to Him. And the Old Testament was a call to tithe. I have two prayers for the finances related to our church. The first one now and the second one in a minute. The first one is this. My regular prayer for you as I pray for you, regarding your finances has, has been to this point and will continue to be this. Lord, bless them 100-fold. Lord, would you take your oatmeal box and dump it on us? Would you pour it? Would you overflow our cups? That is my prayer for you in your life. That is my only prayer Baby, is that my only prayer? Have you ever heard me pray, Lord, lead so-and-so to give such-and-such? Such? I've not done it. It is only when Clayton comes to where he realizes that God has given and given and given and given, and it's just dripping over the plate that Clayton can be the cheerful giver that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I never pray, Lord, impress so-and-so to increase their giving to such-and-such. 
It would be extremely difficult for me to do that because I have no idea how much such and such gives. I know how much hope and I give, and early on I knew how much my parents gave because mom or dad were careful every week to hand me a check. I think they just wanted them to know, son, we believe in what you're doing, and I'm deeply grateful for that. Beyond that, we don't have any idea who gives or how much they give. I think that was mom and dad's letting, way of letting their, know, uh, letting their son know that, that they believe in what he's doing. In mine and Hope's life, our cup is not getting any bigger. Are you with me? Our needs are not getting any bigger. So every time he blesses us more and more and more and dumps out, it just fills the saucer up. And I've got more that I can share. Giving is that spiritual joy that comes in a Christian's life at the moment he or she is overwhelmed with the reality that he or she has been richly it can't be coerced, it can't be mandated, it can't even be taught, it must be experienced. That is what makes a cheerful giver. It is the attitude that I don't have to give, but I must give. Let me give you two events in the life of our church that's driven that home for me. The first one is the Whatever's Next Fund. I called it a minute ago when we started the Building Fund. It is our fifth Sunday offering. The Red Schoolhouse, where did I hide the schoolhouse at? The red schoolhouse that I've shown that my, my dad used back whenever he was teaching school. He built a little schoolhouse, and I thought this would be appropriate to use to capture our building fund. So instead of the offering plate, we've got the little schoolhouse. And this week I cut a notch in it, and I made sure that it had room for, for cash and checks and major credit cards and, and whatever you want to write. I did not, however, make sure that it fit, that it was wide enough for our giving envelopes. And so what I've done is I have opened the front door. The, the, the little envelopes, if you want to write on your envelope and slide it in the front door, it will fit in the front door. So I'm going to leave that right there this morning. And, and you know, I'm just going to, to uh, just give you the opportunity this morning to, to come here and give. That's where I moved the cheese to. I hid the offering plate. I, I wanted to be very transparent with you and let you know that everything that you give today, we're going to earmark it toward that, that, that building fund whatever that looks like. We have, uh, we have committed that we would pay for our bills out of 48 weeks, four weeks a month, and then the fifth Sunday, each of the fifth Sundays of the month, we're, we're going we're to designate for that. We have our work group. I mentioned that last Sunday that we've put together. Uh, they have a green field, everything from we just need to meet in the field and pray, to buy a big tent, to buy an existing building, to build something new. And we're trusting them. We've, we've got some great folks that are on that work group. And I ask you to please pray for them. They had two meetings this week, and I've heard from more than one of them, and the meetings went very well. They have a bias for action. I ask you to fasten your seatbelts. Amen. What does this mean for you as a congregation? Some kind of a building program? No. Pledge cards? No. Sacrificing your firstborn? <laughs> well, maybe. It, you can decide that. Cashing in on your retirement? No. And what does that mean? It means that I ask you to simply continue sharing what's in your saucer. That's it. Continue to share what's in your saucer. Yesterday I had the privilege of working shoulder to shoulder with your generosity. And I love you. I'll remind you that our prayer is for zero rent. Do you know what that means? That means that what we're really asking for is we're asking for God to do that awe-inspiring, jaw-dropping work in our life that is a miracle, that is impossible, or at least highly unlikely, that really doesn't have anything to do with our giving anyway. We're asking God to do something that only He can do. Like our book says, our Draw the Circle book says, we're working like it's depending on us, but we're praying like it depends on Him. Right. We're asking Him to do something in our situation financially. So I just want to take a minute. I don't think we've done this in three and a half years since we started the church because we don't pass an offering plate and we don't ever stop and bless the offering before we pass the plate. Can I just stop for a second and bless this offering today and all of our offerings. And can I, can, can I just encourage you that as you go by faithfully every week 
and drop your, your, your money in the little offering plate back there. Maybe you just want to stop and, and, and maybe not ask God to bless the offering, but us just to bless God that we have an offering to give. So Lord Jesus, on this day, we celebrate and praise and thank you that you have given to us and Father, we praise You and we thank You that You have given us the opportunity to give to others. And so Father, whatever our next step looks like, maybe we'll hear from that in a few weeks. Father, whatever our step, next chapter in our journey looks like, Father, this morning we give You praise and we give You thanks for these gifts, for this offering, Father, I would ask that you would take it and that you would do what only you could do, that you would multiply it and that you would cause us to stop and our mouths would be, our jaws would drop, Father, at the greatness of your gift to us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the chance to give in Jesus' name. Amen. That was the first event in the life of our church. We've got a committee trying to figure out what we're going to do. We have a two-year lease on this building. We've been here for one year already. Can you believe it? Today, exactly one day, the last Sunday in April, it's, it was, it's been one year. Feels like a brand new place to us. So pray for that group. The second event in the life of our uh, church family that I got stuck on when considering the truth that God is not a taker, but He is a giver, is connected closely to what happened here yesterday. And that is that Joey and Aaron and Andrew and Molly Millwood and Justin and Megan and Macy and the whole Millwood family and the Henderson family, which was, which was uh, Eliza Kate's mom's side of the family, today they are grasping and grappling with seeing and recognizing and understanding and feeling and trying to make sense of this truth that God is a giver when it feels to them as though God has taken from them little Eliza Kent. Yesterday we shared of our bounty. Lots of work went into preparing it and lots of hard work yesterday. I worked shoulder to shoulder with you. And can I say to you that when we started to have this little fundraiser, the purpose of it was to help Eliza Kate's family with her current medical bills. Well, Eliza Kate has been promoted to glory now. And so the, the fundraiser yesterday was to help perhaps with some of Eliza Kate's uh, medical bills, but it was also to, also to help with Eliza Kate's burial expenses. As parents, you know you probably don't have a line item on your budget to prepare to plan for your child's funeral. They're grasping with what in the world does that look like? Can I just say to you, it was in celebration of what we did here yesterday, may I celebrate with you, as heartbreaking as it is, as, as tender as we are to the situation, when Hope made the announcement and put it out there about the Eliza Kate Memorial uh, fundraiser, she was careful not to put any exclamation points. Because it wasn't exciting to the Millwood family. But yesterday here, the work that went up to that, we were able to raise... Guess how much? $5,724. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. When my niece Hannah was sick, the body of Christ gave and gave and gave. And I will say that to you that in the midst of our great loss, she was only 18, we were keenly and unmistakably aware that our Father was a giver. And He used the body of Christ to be His hands and His feet. How will the Millwoods know that He is a giver? It is as Thank you for your hard work and your generosity, and I love you for it. There, that was the introduction to the sermon. It was really just Clayton still chewing on Paul's sermon from up on the rock in Athens. 
God's creation is evident in the aroma of the restaurant of the restaurant. <laughs> and God is a giver. Can I get a witness? Amen. I think everyone knows it should have been restaurant, not not, not uh, restaurant. I had that written down here to clear, clarify that as well. Today's message is titled The Sequel. Corinth. Acts chapter 18. The first four verses. If you can, I don't think in three years and a half years I've done this. Would you stand with me as we read together these verses from God's Word? Acts chapter 18, four verses. After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them and being of the same occupation, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but in our churches years and years and years ago, the pastor would say, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of His Word. For these four verses this morning, I want to offer you four points. The first point is simply Corinth in context. That's verse 1. After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth. After what? After he left Athens. May I show you a picture of our map. Lots of visitors, thank you for being here this morning that perhaps haven't seen the map. Paul is on the sequel. That's his second missionary journey. Both of them he started here in Antioch. The first one he went south and then up here and then looped back and went on. The, the one that we're studying now, he went west and north and came to Troas and got to the water and said, Lord, what am I going to do now? And in a vision, God said to him, come over into Macedonia. You may remember that, the Macedonian vision. So he went over into Macedonia. He first went to Philippi, built a church there. They threw him in prison, beat him with rods. The Lord delivered him from prison, and he left there. He went down to Thessalonica. And then he went down to Berea. They chased him out of town in Thessalonica. Then he went down to Berea, and the Thessalonians chased him down to Berea, chased him out of town. They took him down here to Athens. And last week he had the, the, the sermon up on the rock in Athens, on Mars Hill, or the Areopagus. Well, this morning it says after this he left Athens and he went over to Corinth. Can I have the next map, please? It blows it up a little bit for you and sees there's this little skinny piece of land right here that separates this otherwise island from the mainland of Greece here. I, I looked it up and it's called, well, it, it was, it's called an isthmus. Anybody remember an isthmus from geography? Well, I didn't. An isthmus is a little narrow piece of land that connects two larger bodies of water. You've got to be careful how you say that. Uh, it connects this island with the larger part of Greece here. That's where the city of Corinth was at. It's a narrow strip of land connecting to those two areas. May I show you a picture of the remains of a temple of Apollo. Apparently there were 38 pillars in this temple. This is a modern day picture. There are seven of those pillars left. You can imagine the, the picture there right around the water. There was water uh, uh, largely around them. It was an ancient city. You can do your homework. It's another one of those significant cities. The Roman government came to Corinth and they built this large city. So it was a Roman colony in about B.C. 44. We're in about A.D. 50 something. So it's about 100 years old. This city of, 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 of Corinth. You remember that Paul later wrote back two letters. What are these two letters? First and second Corinthians to the Corinthian church that he started. He shows up in town now. In today's terms, Corinth was a very progressive culture. And Paul addresses these two letters to the church at Corinth later in very strong terms, exhorting them to be clean of all impurities and to refrain from immoral behavior, especially sexual impurity. Because there was a lot of sexual impurity that was happening in Corinth at this time. It was difficult. It was a tough city in which to be a Christian. 
after this, Paul said in verse 1, after this he left to Athens and he went to Corinth. Paul, uh, Dr. Luke doesn't give us any chronological cues, uh, cl uh, clues there as to how long after this was. Maybe as soon as he came off the mountain, he took off and went to Corinth. He probably stayed in town for a little bit. They asked him to stay. We saw last week a few people followed him. They started a church there in Corinth. And then at some point, or in Athens, at some point, Paul left and came to Corinth. After this is no specific time. So you will remember with me that Paul, that, that Silas and Timothy were still left behind. Would you go up one slide, please, uh, Josh, to back up to the map? Remember that Paul left Silas and Timothy up here in Thessalonica. He did that so that they could help this brand new baby church learn how to do church. So they stayed there and did a, a Church Growth 101 class while Paul left and came down to Athens and then now he's at court. So he is still there at this point. He is alone. Does anybody know what page I was on? Verse 2 gives us the second point. New friends who became old friends. He came into town, into, uh, into Corinth. Verse 2 tells us where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them. It was a husband and wife team. Do I have the map next, Josh, again? I just wanted to show that Pontus was up here. This was way north. Remember, on Paul's first journey, or second journey, he started to go up north here, and the Lord said, no, don't do that. Well, this is Pontus. This is where Priscilla and Aquila are from. And somehow they made the journey over here to Italy into Rome because it was a great aspirations of going there and starting a life together. And they were living in Rome as entrepreneurial business folks. And the Bible tells us that Claudius ordered the Jews to leave Rome. The Holman Christian Standard Study Bible tells us that Claudius was the Roman emperor between AD 41 and 54. And he expelled the Jews from Rome in AD 49. You know what we call that? We call that Semitic genocide. It is genocide against the Jewish people. Did you know that that's still happening today? If you look at the map, right of the, this is only one little map of a piece of the world. Israel is right there. That's it. That's, that's in all of the world, if you were to be met, bet Midler and you were to stand back and look at the globe from a distance, You'd say, good night, that hardly even shows up on the map. Why is it the subject of so much news and controversy? Why has it been this, the subject for year for, for millennia? Well, it is because God said that you are my people and the rest of the world has ever since been jealous of them. And it still happens today. And it will continue to happen till Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom and says, these are my people, and I'm going to be the king of them and you. Amen? Back in verse 1, Dr. Luke was vague on his timing, but here he says that this, this happened after Claudius had ran the folks out of town. He, once again, Dr. Luke, roots this story in a verifiable historical event. You can go read the history books and find out when this happened. Paul was careful to do that for us so that we would know these are not just made up stories. These are events that happen within the confines of human history. To Aquila and Priscilla, no doubt. Think with me about Aquila and Priscilla. They'd left Pontus and they'd gone to Italy and they'd gone to Rome and there they were. They were going to start a new life and had great aspirations and they get driven out of town. This felt like one of those meaningless threads in their life. Have you had one of those? Have you had a situation in your life that said, that nah, just feels, why, why did that happen? How could I have gotten displaced from here to here? Ronnie and I were praying this morning, and he prayed about the fact that he and Leanne were displaced from Maryland to Bowling Springs, South Carolina. Does it ever feel like a meaningless threat? Can I encourage you, don't be surprised if that random event in your life doesn't turn out to be a main artery of the picture of your journey. Who would have thought that some average middle class small business entrepreneurial Jewish couple 
who moved to the great city of Rome with aspirations of building a life only to find themselves uprooted and expelled and racially discriminated against just for being Jews would land on some isthmus city and bump into the Apostle Paul. Who'd have thunk it? May I fill in the blanks for you? At some point in their lives, at some point in their journey, Aquila and Priscilla said, God, would you please do something in our lives special? Would you do something that we're not anticipating? And then they just went about their daily job of working and waiting for God to do that. I hope you take courage in those words. The dream that you've had, the prayer that you've prayed, and you've left it there, I pray that you'll take great courage in those works. All Paul did was he simply went to work and waited. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla went to work and waited. Brother Paul, then can I close the loop? Brother Paul is alone. Have you ever traveled alone? No pay phone, no pager, no flip phone, no smartphone, no trip advisor, no travelocity. He walks into town all by himself. He probably prayed something like this on his way into town. Father, you ever done this? Would you please guide me and direct my st steps to meet somebody that I can connect with? You ever prayed a prayer like that? God, I, don't, I ain't seeing where I'm headed. I'm going here. I know this is where I'm supposed to go. Can you help me? Father, I am asking you to delight me. Then Paul walked into town, and where did he go? I hate to be a broken record. He went to the marketplace. When he got to the marketplace, he probably asked around, Hey, can anybody tell me where the tent makers are at? New friends, Aquila and Priscilla, Paul came to them. New friends became old friends. Why? Because we will see later that Aquila and Priscilla started traveling with Paul and, si oh, with Paul and Silas and Timothy. Point number three from verse number three, blue collar Paul. Verse three that says, being of the same occupation, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. That's the first time that we have seen that we've been introduced to Paul's occupation. At some point, Paul, Dr. Luke just decides to insert this little nugget into the story that Paul was a tent maker. When Paul got to town, he went to the marketplace and he started asking, Hey, can you tell me where the tent makers are at? I'm a tent maker and I'd like to find some part-time work. Or maybe I'm a tent maker and I have a lot of experience and here's my resume and I'd like to find a full-time job. I've just now arrived here in Corinth. Can somebody please tell me where they're at? And somebody pointed down the street and said, The tent maker's kiosk is right down there. And he goes down there and... The Lord has gone before him and he's woven a loose thread. As I mentioned, to this point in the story, we've not seen Paul as, as working at all or being bivocational. Now, I'll give you some factors why not. Well, some cities, Paul wasn't there long enough to hunt for a job. The home church back in Antioch no doubt had provided some money for him so he didn't have to have a job all the time. He left Silas and Timothy up in Thessalonica. No doubt he left them, them with some money. Whenever he went to, uh, whenever he left them and, and uh, left town, he left them some money. He was about to board a ship to go back home. Probably needed some money for a, a boat ride, a boat ticket. Finally, it's impossible that Paul, that uh, Paul had been working all the time. Doctor Luke just hadn't t taken the time to tell us that yet. But I make this point: Paul was by vocational. He had two jobs. Verse 4 tells us that he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. What did he do the rest of the week? Well, he was down there at the kiosk making tents in the marketplace. So the question arises, Clayton, is that why you're bivocational? Because you want to be like the Apostle Paul? Well, partially, yes. Can you look with me just for a second at the two sides of the coin? First, there are biblical precedences for full-time, call them what you want to, vocational ministers, pastors, associate pastors, earning wages. Yes, there are biblical precedences. Look with me at these verses in, in 1 Corinthians. Again, later Paul writes this letter back to the church of Corinth. Who goes to war as it, at his own expense? You ever have a soldier say, I'll go to war, but I'm going to pay my own way. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat its own fruit? Or who shepherds a flock and doesn't drink the milk from the flock? 
Am I saying this from a human perspective? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, when you've got an ox out there and he's treading the ground, don't muzzle him, unmuzzle him so he can eat some of the, the seed of the ground. Don't muzzle an ox while it treads out grain. Is God really concerned about oxen? Is this example just for oxen or is it for people? Verse 10, or is he really saying it for us? Yes, this is written for us. Because he who plows ought to plow in hope. And he who threshes should do so in hope of sharing in the crop. Verse 11, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it too much if we reap material benefits for you? We see with that and, and some other verses. Here's one in Luke chapter 10, verse 7. This is Jesus about to send the 70 out. Remember that? The first missionary journey, he sends 70 people out. Jesus says this, when you get there, stay in the same house and eat and drink whatever they offer because the worker is worthy of his wages. Don't be moving from house to house. Get somewhere and stay put. Take graciously what they offer to you because the worker is worthy of his wages. There's, there's other passages. Look at this ver these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 5. The elders who are good leaders should be considered worthy of an ample honorarium, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching because the Scripture says, and he goes back and quotes that same verse, don't muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain and the worker is worthy of his wages. The first side of the coin is that there is plenty of Scripture supporting paid staff. Then why did Paul choose to be bivocational? That's the other side of the coin. Will you look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says, For you remember our labor and hardship, brothers, working night and day so that I'm working with my hands as a tent maker. You can do your research. Maybe that was a leather maker. We don't know if they made pup tents or if they made leather or what they did exactly. We worked night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preach, gospel. We preach God's gospel to you. We don't want to burden you. Look at this, these verses in 2 Thessalonians. For you yourselves know how you must imitate us. We were not irresponsible among you. We didn't need anybody's food free of charge. We weren't looking for a handout. Instead, we labored and struggled. We worked night and day out there on the kiosk in the marketplace making tents so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And these and many other verses Paul gives us Two sides of the coin. Here are the two sides of the coin. The worker is worthy of his wages. There are plenty of precedences for having a paid staff. Number two, Paul chose not to accept wages from those to whom he ministered. I found a really good article about being bivocational or not bivocational at, at inthelasthour.com. Here's two exhortations. With or without a paycheck, Clayton, work in such a way that at the end of the week you feel like you deserve a paycheck. No, I don't mean, man, that was a really good sermon, they should pay me. But I mean that feeling that you have after you've split wood in the yard all afternoon, blisters on your hands, and an aching back because you worked hard. That's the first exhortation. With pay or without pay, Clayton, are you working hard? The second exhortation is this. With or without a paycheck, work in such a way that if there was a clone of you, you would support them as a missionary. This person, when you look at their life, you say, that's somebody that I think we should support on the missions because I have watched their life and when they get there, I know that they are going to work. And I'll just say to you that Clayton Houchins feels the weight of that in, this, in, in, in his life. Can I share this personally with you for just a minute? Many folks have said to me over the last couple of years, Clayton, I just don't know how you do it. Working full-time and pastoring full-time, my answer has consistently been the same. It is this. I have been amazingly blessed to be surrounded by great people. Period. That's it. 
That is exactly how I've done it. That is exactly why I would characterize being a part of Church 247, pastoring Church 247 as fun. Because God has surrounded Hope and I with amazing people. In truth, I am to be envied because I know that every pastor wishes that they had what I have. Many do, but I've got it. A people who have a mind to work from the toilet cleaner to the board of elders and everything in between. Are there times that I wish that I had more time to pray and to study and to pray and to read and to pray and to write and to pray and to sit and chat? Absolutely. The truth of the matter is, as I've said, I want to be involved in every bit of it. Wednesday night at music practice, they were practicing and somebody wasn't maybe coming in at the right time and I got up there and I started doing my one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And my wife said to me, they know how to count. <laughs> she didn't get anything from that marriage conference you got to to <laughs> You know, the equal truth is, is is that if I were in the middle of it, I would mess a whole bunch of it up. Why? Because the body is made of many parts. Consider the number of body parts that it took for you to get out of bed and make it to church this morning. How many parts of your body contributed to that? Little effort. We've talked many times about each body part in our church finding its place and doing its part in order to carry out the mission. Here's the mission that I believe that God has put on my heart into the life of our church to help the 46,500 unchurched people in our area to move from where they are to where God wants them to be starting with the sky. How in the world can we possibly tackle that elephant? Point number four, verse number four, persuade whoever shows up. Paul, on the, on the Sabbath, he reasoned. Every day he went to work and probably had blisters on his hands for making tents. But on the Sabbath day, he showed up and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and he tried to persuade everybody in every pew to follow Jesus. He tried to persuade everybody. They, Won't you follow Jesus, Hans? Won't you deepen your relationship with, with Jesus, Patty? Hayden and Danielle, man, I, I hope I get these names right. Hayden and Danielle, won't you deepen your relationship with the Lord? I'm trying to persuade you, and I'm trying to do so by convincing you how very much God <coughs> loves you. He chases after you. How do we tackle the elephant? We try to persuade whoever shows up. I've mentioned it to you a time or two, but it was an epiphany for Clayton in his life. On Easter Sunday morning when we baptized five young people ages 15 and younger. And everybody said, Amen. It hit me. All we have to do is to, run, to change our culture. The only thing we have to do is we have to go out there and round up all of the unchurched youth and children within five miles of here, get them to church, provide them with the good news of the gospel, try to persuade them of God's love, Give them hope and purpose and stability and community in their life. That's all we have to do. And we can change the entire culture. Just got to go get all the kids and round them up and bring them here. That's all we have to do. So here is the ask. I said I was going to talk a lot about giving. and I hope you got the points of giving. You have given. And you are giving. And I thank you for it. Here's the ask. I've talked a dozen times about 247 ways to serve Church 247, but I could never find the right time to share it. I knew that I would know when the time was right, and I just didn't feel it was right until now. This morning, I offer to you 247 ways to serve kids 247 in the hedge. It was an epiphany for me. Actually, perhaps it was when Katie was standing on the stage and she told the church that she gave her heart to Jesus. It was like the Lord smacked me. Clayton, that's all you've got to do. Go get all the kids and bring them here and tell them about Jesus and you can change the culture in one generation because they'll grow up and they'll be the next generation and our culture will have fallen in love with Jesus. One generation. Amen. So I'm asking that every person in our church, this is the ask, here's the invitation time. I'm asking that every person in our church pick a line item from this handout and commit to it. We've got these, I don't know if you've got them 
out on the info. I don't know Tyler and Caleb, but on people's way out, would you please hand one of those? They're real small, and the font's small, you'll have to use your magnifying glass. You might say, but I don't even like children. <laughs> no problem. Can you pray specifically for 10 kids or 50 kids? Can you change the oil on the bus? Can you set up or tear, tear down before a Sunday morning kids 247 church service? Can you shoot a kid a text or write a handwritten note of encouragement? Can you take a pre-written piece of curriculum and share it with a class of spiritually hungry kids who will soak it up like a sponge? And I just say to you that the leadership, our kids and youth leadership, have spent and are spending a lot of time talking about curriculum. You know what that means? That curriculum means this. When you graduate from Josh Lau's youth group, you should know these things. And therefore, in the 11th grade, you should know these things. Therefore, in the 10th grade, you should know these things. All the way down, how do we build a curriculum so that when people, young people leave here, they are ready and prepared and understand how to succeed and flourish in our culture. Curriculum. We're spending a lot of time on that. Can you listen to a kid or a young person quote a Bible verse or... Or maybe tutor a kid or counsel a kid or be a surrogate parent to a kid who is missing a parent in their life. Or maybe you could drive the bus Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights or sometime through the week. 247 ways to serve Kids 247 slash the hedge. We're, at, we're handing these out today and I'm asking you to carefully pray over it. Sunday, June 10th is going to be a significant day in the life of our church. It's going to be our first ever promotion Sunday. A lot more to come on that over the next few weeks. But on that Sunday, based on this list, we're going to have little commitment cards. And I'm going to ask you, because I've never done that. I've never had a card for anything. I'm going to ask you to take that card and, and make a commitment on it. And write down off of that list one of those things. I am the person who will blank. I'm going to ask you to fill that out. This commitment card will simply be for you to indicate the item that, that you want to be a part of. What are we trying to do? We're trying to simply persuade whoever shows up. Whoever shows up, whatever kids show up. And, we, and we've watched it. We've seen it happen. When the kids show up, what do they do? They bring their mama and they don't take it. I've talked a lot about giving. You have given. You are giving. And I'm asking you to consider how you can give to my kids on forward. Today specifically, what I'm asking you to do, I'm asking you simply to consider this. It's the message of this song. We close, we bow your heads and close your eyes with me. This song says, Lord, you've been so good to me. Great, go ahead. Father, I just pray for every one of us starting with me. That we will see and know and sense and understand how very good for you that you have been to us. Lord Jesus, in our lives, that we would just give, pay it forward out of the overflow of the saucer that you have richly blessed us with. In Jesus' name.